Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to Sankofa. Sankofa, a little bit about us. Sankofa is a Pan-African paradise. We were founded in 1998 by Haile and Shariki Anna It's our pleasure to, to welcome you here tonight. Um, who is here for the first time? Can we give the brother a round of applause, please? That was me! That was him! This is the oasis of African thoughts. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, we're really happy to have Dr. Preston here tonight. We saw this book maybe months ago, and we were like, we have to have this in the store. This is Mary McLeod Bethune, The Pan-Africanist. And many people are familiar with Mary McLeod Bethune for being a master educator. But who amongst us knew about her um, expanding her outreach beyond the US? So we're going to learn about that with Dr. Preston. But before I hand over the microphone, let me tell you a little about her. Dr. Ashley Robertson Preston is Assistant Professor of History at Howard University. She's the former director of the Mary McLeod Bethune Foundation National Historic Landmark in Daytona Beach and has worked at the National Archives for Black Women's History at the Mary McLeod Bethune Council House National Historic Site in Washington, D.C. Preston is the author of Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, Bringing Social Justice, Justice to the Sunshine State. Um, without further ado, everyone, please give a round of applause for Dr. Preston. Thank you all so much. Um, when I got the email from Michaela um, about coming to Sankofa, I immediately responded and was really happy um, because when I was a student here at Howard University, um, we would come over to Sankofa and eat and chat and drink our tea, and learn. And even in the process of doing some of the editing for this book, I found myself coming back to Sankofa um, just to be in this space. So it's um, very special to me to be at Sankofa tonight. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to um, everyone that came. Thank you to my friends and colleagues. Um, thank you to my husband. Um, I always say thank you to him because he really gives me an environment to make this writing possible. Um, our son has special needs and we have a lot of things going on. So to be able to complete this book, um, it took time away from a lot of other things that I was doing and without having a partner that supported me, I could not have done it. So thank you. <laughs> So a little bit about this book. Um, first, let me tell you, and I'm looking on my phone because of course this is where we keep all of our notes nowadays. But this is a labor of love that started in 2010. Um, I came to Howard University from Temple after completing a master's in African American studies. Um, I came here to study history, had no dissertation topic. I felt crazy. Everyone, I'm writing on this. I'm writing on that. Everyone seemed to know what their topic was, and I had no idea. So my topic really found me. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis came into our class. My colleague is here. Um, she said, well, you should go down to the council house. I went to the council house. I started as a volunteer. And from there, I got a job. And I started learning more about Mrs. Bethune's life on this job at the National Archives for Black Women's History. And it was really a transformative position. Um, I volunteered, but I, I probably could have kept volunteering. I loved it so much. Um, just to be there to learn about all of these black women um, the National Archives for Black Women's History is one of the only repositories dedicated solely to the preservation of Black women's history. So to be there um, was very much a learning experience. And so this is where I found the topic. Um, my <clears throat> major was African diaspora, and so I thought, hmm, I'll volunteer at the Mary McLeod Bethune Home, but surely she hasn't done anything on an international level. I knew about her as an educator, 
you know, I started learning about her work in D.C., being in the home, but it did not really resonate with me until I saw two things. <clears throat> I saw that she traveled to Haiti in 1949, and I saw that she traveled to Liberia in 1952. So those were the first two clues. I said, hmm, maybe there's more information. And as I started to dig, I found that she was known internationally. She had traveled. I mean, when we think about traveling now, you know, we just book a flight and go. And think about her traveling in 1927, traveling to Cuba in 1930, the challenges that she faced just in taking her trip to Cuba. Um, she gets there and they tell her she cannot enter the country. And all of the other people in her party who are much lighter than she is, they are allowed to pass and she has to wait. And so in working in the council house, I learned more about her work in DC, but I also was able to complete the dissertation. And thereafter, I accepted a job in Daytona Beach running Mrs. Bethune's home. And so I put this work on the shelf for several years, but it was really to my benefit because I learned so much about her life in Daytona, um, running her home, meeting people who actually knew her. Um, the first book has four interviews of folks who knew her, her grandson who was 96 when he passed away, who was raised as her legally adopted son her last um, secretary, who talks about the three wishes that she had on her last day of life. So being in DC, being in Daytona, learning about her life in those places, and then also having um, done this work on her internationally, I feel like within these last 13 years, I have really gained a greater picture of the different layers of Mrs. Bethune's work as an entrepreneur, as a mother, as an educator, as a world leader. Um, typically folks talk about her work as an educator and maybe her work with the Roosevelt's, um, but there are so many different things that she did, investing in a black beach in Daytona. I mean, I'm still learning more and more and more about her life. And I used to wonder, how is it that this woman was able to do so much? And someone asked me a question about that the last time I presented somewhere. And I said, the funny thing about it is when I met her grandson, I asked him that question. And he said, well, she had a couch in her office and she would take a nap every day after lunch. Just a fun fact. But when I think about that self-care and that preservation, and how she was doing so many things, it gave me a clearer picture of the importance of rest. And so over the past 13 years, um, having studied her work um, in various places, visiting different archives, working in different archives, um, and putting this book together as first as a dissertation, but going back and rewriting it, I revisited some of those archives but I also added some new archives to this. And so I was able to reach out to people in Canada. I went on Facebook and found a group called the Hour a Day Study Group. And it was a group of black women in Canada who had a club that had been around for several decades. And I saw it and was able to find people who remembered Mrs. Bethune coming to Canada in 1954. So that's the type of insight that I was able to gain in just taking my time and completing this book and really um, not rushing it immediately after the dissertation. So this is about 13 years in the making. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the different chapters of the book. Chapter one, I start off um, looking at her early years. And I have been really um, interested in the early life of many historical figures in this last couple of years, because I think that's something that we kind of rush past sometimes 
we want to look at the height, quote unquote, the height of their career. But when we look at Mrs. Bethune growing up in South Carolina, and I talk about South Carolina as an African space, how does that shape who she would become? What is the significance of South Carolina? And just another example, when we look at folks like Malcolm X, right? We talk about his career and we talk about his work with the nation and all of those things. But if we look back at his parents and those earlier years of his parents being followers of Garvey, how does that shape young Malcolm's life? When we look at Miss Ida B. Wells Barnett losing her parents at a young age, how does that shape her into the activist that she would become, the radical that she would become? losing those parents. And so I was very intentional about taking more time and looking at her earlier years, um, being in South Carolina, and South Carolina being an important space. Um, when we look at the sheer number of Africans um, who passed through the state, one of the largest slave ports in Charleston, how does that impact Africans in South Carolina? Sorry, I have some things in the book that I wanted to read directly. I won't give you all the book, but. We talk about the 1880 census and how it revealed in that South Carolina, followed by Georgia, Louisiana, and Alabama had the largest number of children born to African parents. Mrs. Patsy McLeod would have been included in this number as it was her side of the family that Bethune recalled as being a direct African descendant. And so when we talk about historical memory um, being transmitted by those who experience the beauty of life in Africa, you know, Mrs. Bethune talks about hearing this on her mother's side of the family, hearing about being African, like how does that change who she was? How does that um, make her more prideful in who she was, being in South Carolina, knowing that about her family? And so we also recognize the importance of the Gullah community and the retention of culture in South Carolina. She is about 100 miles away from the Gullah coast, but surely that has an impact on South Carolinians. And so her being born into that state um, is a very special place. And she talks a little bit about um, growing up, but mostly she talks about just knowing that her mother's side is from, um, is, is African and from a royal lineage. And so I talk a little bit about that in chapter one. Also the significance of I talk about the significance of the school, Bethune Cookman College. And so early on, Mrs. Bethune has this desire to go back to Africa. When she's about 20 years old, she decides to go back to Africa as a missionary, but she's told no. So she becomes an educator. And so when we look at what she was able to accomplish in Daytona, you know, she's very crushed by not being able to go to Africa. But she says, I will make this my Africa. And so she puts her hands to work. She does a lot in the community. And not only in the community, but within her school. She's educating her students on Black history and the importance of the African past. She says, when they learn the fairy tales of mythical king and queen and princess, we must, we must let them hear two of the pharaohs and African kings and the brilliant pageantry of the Valley of the Nile. When they learn of Caesar and his legions, we must teach them of Hannibal and his Africans. When they learn of Shakespeare, we must teach them of Pushkin and Dumas. When they read of Columbus, we must introduce the Africans who touched the shores of America before Europeans emerged from savagery. And so, 
you know, this is the side of Ms. Bethune that we talk, don't talk about enough. She's encouraging the study of black history. She's, in, she's encouraging the study of African history. And so when we look at her school in those earlier years, you know, she is very much a fan of Booker T. Washington, right? And so we think that she's just teaching her students uh, dressmaking and farming. Uh, but there's more than industrial education that's taking place. She is also instilling some of the things that she learned as a child within the education that she is giving those students, not just in those early years, but throughout, but throughout the years that she is the, the educator and president of the school. And so I also talk a bit about how um, she calls Africa her home. Sorry, my mic is going in and out a little bit. Okay. But when she goes back to, and I'm sorry, I'm skipping a little bit, but she wants to go to Africa at the age of 20, but it, it's not until 1952, when she's about 76 years old, that she actually is able to travel to Liberia. And so all of those years in between, she still has this desire and so when she goes in 1952, when she goes in 1952, she says, I was thrilled to set foot in this soil of Africa, which I have so long dreamed of visiting, of returning to my homeland, to my homeland. So all of these years, although she is unable to visit the continent, she still sees this as the homeland. She sees this as a place in which she belongs just as much as she is American. And Ms. Bethune was definitely a patriot. But as much as she is American, she says that Africa is definitely my homeland. And so we see throughout the book, um, all of these different instances of her um, lifting Africa up historically, lifting the idea of visiting Africa up. After she comes back from Liberia, she tells other people in her writings, she's a writer for the Chicago Defender, she has a column, and she encourages folks to go back to Africa. She encourages them to visit. She encourages them to go and serve. So she's very intentional about how she uses her voice um, in knowing that she's very influential. Um, she uses it as a way to try to encourage other people and to educate them about Africa and its greatness. One of the major um, parts of Mrs. Bethune's work, of course, is her work with the National Council of Negro Women, which she starts in 1935. But prior to her starting National Council of Negro Women, she is a part of National Association of Colored Women, which is founded in 1896. She's the president from 1924 to 28. And during this time, I, I talk about how important this is. This is almost a training ground for Mrs. Bethune as a leader. She has been, she started her school in 1904, but she really seeks to expand to try to learn about and to meet more people, to bring more people into her network. And so when she joins NACW and becomes the president, she also meets a lot of folks who are coming in from around the world. Um, she talks about how she meets people who travel, who go to Africa. Um, she talks about wanting to really internationalize the scope of NACW a bit more. Um, she encourages them to become the link among people of color around the world. And so they are interested in what she has to say, but it's not until she creates NCW that she can really, you know, this is her baby, so she can really have that influence. And so we look at NCW, we see her bringing in women like Sue Bailey Thurman. Um, Sue Bailey Thurman is a powerhouse. Um, I actually have a student that is writing on her right now. Um, because there has not been enough attention given to Sue Bailey Thurman. 
and then she comes in to NCW. She takes them to um, Cuba where they meet Afro-Cubans. Um, she's also the, the person who's the editor of the Afro-American Journal. This is the journal that is capturing um, all of the events and the history of NCW, but they're also welcoming correspondents from other countries. They're also taking this journal to, with them to Cuba. They're documenting their trip to Cuba in the Afro-American Journal to share with NCNW members. So, so Mrs. Bethune is really encouraging unity among people of African descent, unity among NCNW members, um, unity among her readers for the Chicago Defender. As she is telling, you know, this is one of the most influential black newspapers of the time. And she's telling people, go to Africa, go to Haiti, learn about these people. It's not just us and our struggles here in the United States, but we have a responsibility to connect with people beyond the United States. Um, when we look at the Council House, which is now a part of the National Park Service, but this um, cover is actually uh, from a meeting at the Council House it's an intercultural um, meeting that they have for students. So they're inviting students from, foreign students, my apologies, students from Howard, students from different universities to come and gather at the council house. And so this is very much an important space for people of color who come to, to the United States. When we think about segregation in D.C., you know, we can go we can stay in hotels in D.C. now. You know, we have the ability to go where we need to go. But they were renting rooms. They were allowing people to have meetings there. It was a safe space for people of African descent. It was a safe space for people who needed to come and gather and meet. And it was also a place where Mrs. Bethune could talk and mentor and really give advice to the people who came to visit. Make sure I cover all of my points. So this um, trip to Canada in 1954, this is something that I actually did not include in the dissertation, right? Because as I was thinking about Canada, I wasn't quite sure what she was doing in Canada, right? Um, but she was actually there to attend an emancipation celebration. And the idea of emancipation meant a lot to Mrs. Bethune. She would have emancipation celebrations at, how, at um, Bethune-Cookman, her school. For many years, they would have those programs because she was the daughter of formerly enslaved parents. Her brothers and sisters had been formerly enslaved. So the idea of emancipation resonated with her. So she goes to the emancipation program, and she's there to speak. Um, as a part of the program, but she's also meeting with women while she's in Canada. She's encour encouraging them to serve. She's encouraging them to take a stance against segregation. As a matter of fact, as a part of that emancipation program, just the night before, she had experienced discrimination. She shows up to the hotel um, along with First Lady Roosevelt, and she is told that she cannot stay in the hotel because she's black. And so when she goes to the emancipation celebration the next day, she speaks to that. She says, we still have work to do. We still have um, things that need to be done. We still have to take a stance against segregation and inequality. And so she's speaking to this large audience in Canada. And these are just some of uh, her travels. But in her later years, after she retires from NCNW, she takes on this role of being a mentor internationally. I, I would argue that in those last few years, she's actually a bit more free. Because if you think about her running the school full time, uh, being the president of NCNW, working with the National Youth Administration, I mean, she does a lot. And then when she retires, she's able to travel freely and meet with people and really share the wisdom from all of those years of involvement and activism. And the last thing I'll say before I open it up um, for questions and comments, um, I hope that this book 
um, will really give people insight into how important Mrs. Bethune's work was. Um, she's right there beside Du Bois, right, at the founding of the UN. She's right there beside Walter White. She's working with so many men who have been recognized, who have been credited, who are, you know, books, 20 million books written about them. And so my intention is to really continue to write about Mrs. Bethune, um, to give more people more insight, and to get, put her in her rightful place up there with all of those other men who have been credited, particularly as Pan-Africanist, because this woman traveled and was involved much more than some of these other men. And so it's really time that we stop thinking of Pan-Africanism as something that can be dominated by male voices. It's there among women too, and not just women who attend Pan-African Congresses, not women who know Garvey or are part of Garvey's movement, but women like Mrs. Bethune who have their own organizations also. And so um, I'm excited about this work and I hope that you know, people really see her for who she is, not just as an educator, not just bo boxing her in, you know, as, oh, she worked with the Roosevelt's. She did so many more things, um, and she was respected internationally by her peers. Um, Madam Pandit of India, um, letters from places around the world, letters from Haiti. She's invited to Haiti in 1949, the Bahamas, I mean, she is really traveling at a time where everyone is not able to travel in this way. And these are not trips in which she's just on vacation and, and drinking mimosas, right? She is really out here connecting people. She's visiting schools. Once she comes back from Haiti, she makes it her business to try to raise money for an orphanage in Haiti. She's asking these women to join National Council of Negro Women. I mean, she is on a mission with this travel, and part of the mission is to unite people of African descent and to help them understand that their struggles are connected. I'll open the floor for questions. <laughs> And can I give one more shout out? I know it's a little late, but I want to shout out my mentor, Dr. Belithia Watkins, who's just sitting here chilling. And I'm so happy to see her. When I was a student at Bowie State University, she encouraged me to become a historian at a time when I did not know what that was. I was like, no, I need to go get some money. I am a business major. And sure enough, I'm a historian now, and Dr. Watkins and her husband, Dr. Beatty, um, they took interest in me and they mentored me. I mean, mentored. I mean, on the phone, helping me with applications, the whole nine. So I, I really, really thank you, and I'm so happy to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. We want to make sure we have a, a good um, audience. online on the audience. Yes. And thank you to the online audience. Much appreciated. And they can ask questions too, right? I'm, I'm looking at the chat. So if you okay. have questions online, feel okay. free. Thank you so much for your talk. It was, it was really enlightening. It was also soothing. You have a very soothing <laughs> voice and presence. So I appreciated that. I wanted to know about your process coming to the heart of this topic and you know, how you chose Mary McLeod Bethune or did she choose you? And whether you came at it from putting her, leading with her or leading with Pan-Africanism and finding her there, or I would just love to hear more about your journey writing about her. 
So, Mrs. Bethune found me. Um, when I came to Howard, I knew about her, but I didn't really know that much. Um, and while I was in the council house um, working in the National Archives, I actually thought I was going to do a topic on like the Black Panther Party. I wanted to do something on their community work. Um, I don't know how I was going to make that work as a diaspora major, but yeah, I don't know. That's where I was in my head because in my mind I had to do something radical because that's where that's what I thought radical was, right? And so as I was in the archives working with researchers, like I think I found my story within her story being that she was from North Carolina, I mean, South Carolina, I'm from North Carolina, small town, value of education, just seeing how far she went in life with education, something about that really stuck with me. Um, and I just really fell in love with her story. I think that's the power of historic homes. When you work in a historic home, you tell the story so much that it becomes a part of your story. Like you really connect with it, some aspect of it, you'll connect with it. And so about her being a Pan-Africanist, um, I'll be honest and say, when I did the dissertation, I was actually kind of afraid to say that she was a Pan-Africanist. I just, I had never heard that before, and it sounded too, I don't know, it just, it, it just, it sounded a bit crazy. I was like, okay, I know Garvey, I know Du Bois, and so that's why I made the title Mary McLeod Bethune the Pan-Africanist. Because I just want to drop the mic after that. Like, yeah. like yeah. we're not going to fight about it. We're not going to debate. I'm going to show you she's a Pan-Africanist. And that's the end of the topic. Like, it had to be very clear cut. Um, so I found her um, before I found Pan-Africanism. I saw it within the work. But I was honestly, um, because it had been such a male-dominated topic that I was not quite sure that I could say that. And so that's the difference in 2010, starting this project and finishing it in 2023. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, Doc. Good to meet you. <laughs> Likewise, congratulations on this. Two things. First, I want to give a shout out to your mentor. <laughs> because mentorship is extremely important. A lot of times we forget about the people whose shoulders we stand on, and there are so many of us all the time, always writing for us as a culture and as a people and as students, you know, um, having gone through the process myself. So, you know, congratulations on your mentorship and to see the fruit of your hard work. I hope there will continue to be more scholars like yourself, and thank you for bringing forth Dr. Preston. Thank you. Um, so my name is Dr. Ayasakai, and I am here to support Dr. Preston, and thank you for the invitation. And one of the last things that you said about your hopes and your dreams, right? A lot of the problems that we have in our community, with, especially with black folks, and the pioneers who have come before us and set the pace and set the examples, and they're just buried. You know, just buried. I remember when I was doing my master's you know, at USF in Florida, and learning that Toni Morrison's grave was covered with, was overgrown and covered with dirt, and learning about all of these great writers and readers that we've studied, yet they have been forgotten in the most important ways. And I'm trying to understand, and I guess I want you to expound on that a little bit more. How do you intend to ensure the memory of Mary Kutu? Like you are saying that you want to keep writing about her, you want people to know that she's a Pan-Africanist. You want to know, want people to know how important she is. How do you intend to do that? Are you going to teach her in your classes? Are you going to take trips? Are you going to, you know, I mean, what, what um, are the broader steps that you intend to take? Because we do know that academics like ourselves, we talk yeah. to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're preaching to the choir all the time. We know what the problems are, right? And we're talking to each other about it, but the people on the ground who are activated, the people who can get the work done, they're usually not getting the message. So how do you get that into their hands? Out of the classroom, out of the bookstore, and into the hands of those who really need it the most, and who can be empowered by it, and who can put the work in. Yes. Yes. 
Good question. Thank you. Um, so I think one of the important aspects of my work is public history. Um, public history for me has been the most significant way other than these books that I have been able to let people know about the legacy of Mrs. Bethune. Uh, when I was in Daytona, I did um, a historical marker for Bethune Beach. Bethune Beach is a beach that Mrs. Bethune invested in um, at a time when black people couldn't go to the beach. She got together with her wealthy friends and they bought a beach. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so now that beach is no longer owned by African Americans. I think there may be about three black owners who are out there. And there was no marker, no mention, no nothing. And so I worked together with the Bethune uh, Beach uh, Homeowners Association to do a historical marker and pla placards out there um, to talk about Ms. Bethune's work. So public history, taking this information that's in the book out to the general public, um, and the next thing that I'm really interested in is digital publishing. Last summer, I did a institute with Brown University on digital publishing. I had never heard of the concept. I was just applying. But now I'm working on a digital project, something that will be online, that gives you, it's going to be called the, the Fierce Activism of Mary McLeod Bethune, maps that show these different places. Um, transcriptions of some of her speeches, um, bringing those speeches out of those archives, out of those Chicago defenders, you know, where she had this column. I know how to go in there and search for it, but I can pull that information out and it'll be a part of the digital project. So that's the next major piece of it. And lastly, social media, and of course my students, if they don't know anyone else, they always, go, they know Mary McLeod Bethune. <laughs> And they know Dr. Carter G. Woodson. That's right. That's my primary. And my baby is named after Carter G. Woodson. So they got to know Carter G. Woodson. Hello, congratulations. My question is um, what process did you take to turn the dissertation? <laughs> so, um, this is we probably talk offline about this question for about the next two hours because um, it's a lot, it's a lot. And this is my brother Latif, Dr. Latif. We did our PhDs at Howard together. And that dissertation process, I think, first of all, I had to um, let go of some of the trauma because dissertations, y'all, the work that you do, like, I think you come out a little, I don't know. It's like, it's so much work that you put into it. It's just like looking back at the dissertation. For me, it was like, I felt overwhelmed every time I would go back to it, right? And so first of all, giving myself the space to just say I don't have to publish it now, that was the first thing. And then working through pieces of it, the first thing I did was I, my dissertation was arranged by theme and I had to go back and make it chronological. That was the hardest part because I had a section on the Caribbean I had a section on Africa, like I had it all in different themes, and then I had to go back and make it chronological. That took a long time. After that part of it, um, I took it chapter by chapter. Like I would take one chapter and sit with it a couple of weeks, kind of massage it, um, and I had really great mentors, people who have done this before that I would call them and ask them, like, what else do I need to do? Because I think the language that we use in a dissertation is so technical that I had to tap into the narrative aspect of it. And so I almost had to just kind of, I guess like 
turn my brain, like flip, flip the switch in my brain to a narrative. And I'm, I'm good at storytelling, so it wasn't hard, but it was hard because it was that document that had already been written. So I do think that turning a dissertation into a book is actually harder because you're starting with something that's already written and having to kind of fix it, if that makes sense. Hello. Um, I don't know if you addressed this earlier in your lecture because I came in late, but do you tra travel internationally at all for your dissert dissertation? I did not travel, um, but I did reach out to some archives that were in Canada. Like I was able to get a lot of stuff digitally. I was able to get um, newspapers from Bermuda, from online. So. That's the great thing about doing this in 20, from about 2020 to 2023 versus 2013. There were so many more sources that had been digitized internationally to where I didn't have to travel. I was able to just kind of request a lot of stuff. And shout out to my friends in Canada that I made through this process because they were so incredibly helpful. I mean, I found the hour a day study group on Facebook she connected me with Miss um, Miss Harding, who was in Canada. Like we did a phone interview. They sent me to different archives. I mean, it was really incredible. Um, I think that COVID has given us some benefits in terms of things being accessible digital digitally now. Right. And what um, city in Canada was she active? Was she connected with the ladies in Canada? Windsor. When, oh, that's right by Detroit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happened was when she was in, in Windsor and she the, the hotel didn't work out, she got turned around, she actually went back across to Detroit oh, okay. and stayed in Detroit. So she was going back and forth. But um, And she also visited in 1945. Um, I think she went to Montreal when she came in 1945. Okay. And I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, around Thanksgiving time, I follow um, National Council on the Negro Women on Facebook, and they always post that story about how she ba baked um, sweet potato pies. And I was wondering, how much money did she, was she able to raise to bake the pies to sell? I don't have a dollar amount on the pies, but when I was at Bethel Cookman, they always talked about the pies. They yeah. had the recipe for the pies. Oh, really? So I'm guessing it must have been a significant yeah. amount. I don't know. Yeah. But I would say for Mrs. Bethune, um, like in some of the letters that I've seen of her getting donations, $5, $10, $10,000, she mm -hmm. was always equally grateful for anybody that was investing in her yeah. school. Yeah, thank you. And I look forward to reading the book. Thank you. Oh, and one other thing, well, final comment I have. I used to work um, for Interaction and um, National Council of Negro and Women is a member. And I always wonder why they were a member, but this explains it all now to me. And thank you again for your book. Oh, thank you. Um, Dr. Preston, I want to first of all thank you for doing the work. That's what really, really will be a gift to our community. Um, and thank you for highlighting the intergenerational con uh, transference of knowledge from her parents and her ancestors um, that gave her the kind of guidance that's really important in terms of genealogy. And so you've talked about it in that respect. You've talked about her mentoring younger generation. And so what I'm interested in is um, her network of women internationally and here in terms of organization. And so could you talk about her relationship with some of the other leaders. I, I, I find interesting in 1924, when she became president of NACW, uh, she ran against Ida B. Wells. Mm -hmm. um, and out of 700 votes, she got 658. So just looking at um, her relationship to you know people like Ida B. Wells or other um, Margaret um, Murray, oh, yes. Washington and others, uh, can you talk about the other black women leaders and her relationship with them, women leaders? So she, I think that's another book, but I don't know if I have time. 
Yeah. Uh, ooh. Uh, but she had a really good network of women that she was able to call on. Um, when you look at everything that Mrs. Bethune was able to accomplish, it looks overwhelming. But because of her network and how she tapped into those women, I mean, uh, earlier I talked about her relationship with Sue Bailey Thurman. Sue Bailey Thurman, of course, you know, her husband, Howard Thurman. Everybody knows about Howard Thurman. But Sue Bailey Thurman had traveled internationally also. She went with him to India. And so when she comes back to be a part of NCNW, she brings that international experience. She takes them to Cuba. She's writing the Afro-American Journal. Margaret Murray Washington um, and Mary Church Terrell, these are two women that Mrs. Bethune looked at as mentors. She called Margaret Murray Washington her big sister. Um, when she becomes a part of the International Council of Women of Darker Races, she comes into this organization because of her work with Margaret Murray Washington. And so she really leans into um, the sisterhood. Um, Mary Church Terrell, um, it's really funny because Terrell actually didn't see a reason for her to start in CNW. She talks about, you know, the meeting notes, she's like, I mean, I don't see a reason to start another organization, but I'll, I'll join anyway. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and sign off on it. But she looks up to Mary Church Terrell. Mary Church Terrell speaks several different languages. You know, she travels internationally. And so when she invites NACW to the first um, international trip in 1927, they're going to Europe. Um, she says to um, Mary Church Terrell, I know you'll be happy that we're going on our international trip because she wants her approval. You know, she looks at her as a mentor, as someone that she wants to um, be in relation with. But it's funny because they also have this, I wouldn't say like a back and forth, but I guess it's like real sisterhood. Like, you know, they don't always agree. And that's one of the things um, about the question about, you know, how do I tend to let other people know about, um, not just Mrs. Bethune, but some of this, um, this history I've been wanting to do a podcast on like historical beef, actually looking at, you know, how people had conflict because we kind of romanticize this history, right? Mm -hmm. You see all of these women in the picture, everybody's dressed very nicely. And I read the letters and they're like, really like kind of going off on each other. <laughs> like they're working together, but they're like going off. Like I talk about her little spat with Du Bois in the book, like, Du Bois call her a nuisance, but they're in the picture, like, stand in the picture together, like, you know what I mean? So we have to get into that, too, but she has so many phenomenal women who she worked with, and they were able to put aside differences to get the work done, and I don't think enough of us focus on getting the work done putting aside whatever and just getting it done. They were able to accomplish so much with so little because the focus was the work. Uh, Dr. Brunson, congratulations on, on, the, on the book. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, to read it. Um, what, my question is, um, you know, as a writer, um, and you talked about a little bit about your journey, you know, to, to writing this book. Uh, what were some like constraints that you had as far as um, you know timelines or deadlines or dealing with all the information on Miss Bethune? Um, you know, was there maybe a chapter that you left out that you wanted to, to get in? Because um, oftentimes when I read, I'm always interested as as to what didn't make the book. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so what didn't make the book? from the initial manuscript, um, there was a long chapter on NCNW's continued international involvement, like well beyond Mrs. Bethune. And I kind of shortened that. I talk a little bit about the next few presidents, but I shortened that because I thought that it kind of took away, it kind of took, I wanted the focus to be primarily on Mrs. Bethune and her direct influence on NCNW. So the women that she worked with, and I go up until about um, 1960, 
which is five years after her passing. So that's one of the things that didn't make it. Constraints. Um, when I was writing my other book on Mrs. Bethune in 2015, um, I was in Daytona. Uh, I was single. I didn't have kid, a kid. I had all of the time in the world to just write. And this time, I am an assistant professor. I'm married. I have a, a son that has special needs. So my time is very limited. Like, I have a to-do list every day. I have a calendar that has stuff on it every day. And I had to really be intentional. Like, I would schedule the writing. Wednesday, I'm writing from 8 to 12. And I would leave home and go downtown and write. And so I had to really make this project like a main focus of everything that I was doing. And um, it was a lot. It was a lot. I, I say this is like, um, this is Carter's little book brother. This is like a little, his little brother. Because this, this was like a baby. Like this is a process. Um, and, and writing for academic press um, is much different. Um, and lastly, constraints. Um, yeah, I just think time was the major thing. But as you know, working uh, on Miss Bethune, there's so much information. There's so much information and so many more things that need to be written. And so I'm trying to just manage that. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for doing this book. Uh, um, I guess we're all children of Dr. Watkins in here because we went we took black women in America across the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, NCW uh, at Howard for me was like my first taste of activism for real, for real. So I, I was very excited to hear this talk. Um, I'm also here. Curious to hear about your time, like writing for academic press. Like, what is that process like, and like, how would you do it again first, and why or why not? Um, would I do it again? Possibly. Actually, I think I will, but I won't do it at the same pace. I feel like I was trying to. It, it's like. It had sat on the shelf for so long that it was like, I need to hurry up and get this out. Um, and I don't think this time, I think I'll take my time a little more with it. Um, I'll take my time more with the next topic. But uh, writing for the academic press, as far as the difference from a coffee table book to academic press, um, you have more eyes on it and more people who actually specialize in what you're writing. Um, and they get, I mean, Talk about trauma. The first um, reader report that I got back, it was just pages and pages of, and on this page, you didn't do it. And this, I was like, oh my God, can I actually do this project? I don't know if I can, because the, 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 I mean, it was so many things that it seemed like I had done wrong. And I was just really um, discouraged by it. So I let it sit for a while until I could really come back to it and realize that it was just constructive criticism from someone who actually knew the topic. <laughs> so it's not, you know, someone reading it who specializes in, um, in uh, 18th century. No, this is someone who knows, no, you didn't, you didn't look at that source because that talks about it and then you need to look at this. You know, so that was the difference and I, I just think it made it, it did make it a lot stronger because some of the things that you're going to, um, face once the book is published and kind of guide you towards that th during the writing process. So um, I would do it again. I I think it's one of those things that once you get your first one done, you know, you, you kind of know how to do it. But I don't think I w I'll be one of those people that pops out a book every year because um, I want to breathe yeah. and I want to get this public history work done too. Thank you. Can I just add to what you said, I mean, about the academic publishing process? Um, 
a big part of having eyes on your work as an academic scholar, if you're going through the academic publishing process, is that not only will your colleagues be able to stand up for you and advocate for you and celebrate you because they know that you went through the process and you have actually done the right thing, but also your publisher can stand behind your work knowing that you have done the, the background check, the research, um, and the and got garnered all the right information to put into the book, which is what why academic publishing is so strong, so much more than a coffee table book or fiction writing, right? Um, it really um, gives validity to your research, to your degree, to your background. And if you are an up and coming scholar or you're in the academy and you're looking to get tenure, you need to have valid research. Um, that has been done through a peer review process in order for your work to be validated and respected by your community of peers. Um, and so that's a big part of the process. You also mentioned something about references and citations. And that's something that I'm really um, passionate about. You know, I mean, not just as a PhD from Howard University, because I learned a lot of the things about black people also going through that PhD process um, in black history. Um, but also, what I am learning is that referencing, a lot of us are white people and white men are the experts in the field on most of our research, right? And unfortunately, that means that a lot of us submitting to journal articles and book publishers, the reviews coming back, they're telling us, oh, you didn't reference this white person or that white person because they're the expert in the field. And I just want to encourage everybody that that's not what I'm not saying that's what you did, you know, because um, I'm a big believer in citing black women, citing black scholars. Um, and that's a really tough thing to do when 80% of the publication has been done by white men across the academy and across disciplines. So I just want to encourage everyone to just remember your citations and references and dig deep, find those black scholars, find those black women and cite the heck out of them because that's going to make the difference in our representation and us showing up um, publicly as academicians. This would be the last one. What is the biggest impact that writing this book has had on you personally? Like whether it's self esteem, um, change your daily thoughts, or what is the biggest way it affected your life? Um, I think it, it's given me some more confidence that I am I am the Bethune scholar. Um, this is no one has said this stuff about Mrs. Bethune. Like this is this is I know that this is going to change how people see her. I know that it is also going to pave the way for other Black women to be recognized as Pan Africanist. And so I just feel like I'm doing this Bethune justice. And I'm happy about that. And I know that I have other work to do for her too, because she deserves it. So again, I want to thank everyone for coming out, especially Dr. Preston. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. We're very happy about it too. So um, we look forward to the public works that you're going to create and we look forward to having you back at Sankofa. If you'd like to purchase the book um, for our online audience, we do have it available online at sankofa.com. And for everyone here, you see we have this nice luscious stack which can be purchased in the back and then uh, Dr. Preston, I'm sure, will sign it up here. Um, again, thank you. And please give Dr. Preston another round of applause for all the hard work. Thank <laughs> you.